their ideas and views and perspectives on what's happening with COVID in our world. Before we get into the program, I just want to take a brief moment and let everybody know once again that unfortunately it looks like due to the pandemic, we're not going to be able to meet in person until the fall of 2021. Therefore, I would like to create an ad hoc committee on programming so we can continue these great quality webinars that we're having today. I've already had a couple people sign up, Michael Klein and Larry Lund. So if you'd like to join us as we think about ways to keep connected to our members and providing services, we'd really like to hear from you. Drop me an email or send one to lai at lai.org. And with that, welcome everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Bill de St. Aubin, the president of the Atlanta chapter. Bill? All right. Well, welcome everybody uh, to Atlanta from wherever you are. And we're really honored to uh, kind of host and sponsor this. Um, and, and we're really kind of, this is one of the blessings and awakenings of the pandemic, the fact that you can uh, connect quickly. We've always been able to do that, but we're doing, everybody's getting used to do that. And you can have uh, experts from around the world on a panel without flying them in. So this is, this is uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, and, and also you can have attendance from around the world. So this has been a, uh, an honor to be part of, and um, we're, we're excited about the panelists we've, uh, we've been able to, uh, pull together, you know, about when the when the pandemic first uh, came about and you know, running an architectural firm, we had to shuffle a lot of things. But uh, uh, being a leader, you kind of have to chart a path forward that's positive. And I was struggling, you know, I was struggling. But then I began to see the air clean. And I began to see people have more leisure time. I began to see bicycle sales go up. And I, you know, I saw the oil industry you know, basically give away oil because they couldn't sell it. And, and I began to wonder, I began to wonder, maybe there is some positive things that are gonna come out of this. Um, and so we began to pull a panel together and uh, I wanted to talk to the experts, not just what I was wondering. And so we, we were blessed to have a, a great group of people here. Um, I'll, I'll introduce them briefly and let them introduce themselves a little uh, further as we begin to disc the question part of it. Well, we have Dr. Peter uh, Thomas with the CDC and with the Public Health uh, Service. We have Dr. Uh, in, here in, in, in Atlanta, but he operates around the world. And he's an epidemiologist, for, I thought was the first person I really wanted to talk to. Um, and then Dr. Uh, Brad Bass uh, with uh, the uh, Environmental Climate of Canada, but he's also uh, at the University in Toronto. He has 150 students uh, modeling uh, different things that are going on in the environment right now. And then uh, Dr. Tom Cumming, who is here in Atlanta, but has worked with the Federal Reserve, and he's the chief economist at the Metro Atlanta, Metro Atlanta Chamber. And he was uh, kind enough to speak to us at the beginning of the year before the pandemic hit the states and uh, said the economy was looking pretty good. We don't have to have a recession and set unless something catastrophic happens. So, where I'm looking forward to his update uh, on that on that uh, front, but we really what we really want to do is, is is we've got a series of questions that are like just three questions related to each um, expertise that I'm going to ask each one of them to answer, and we'll focus on a certain area, and then we have two questions that are more global in nature that will turn more into a discussion. Uh, so I have five questions total for each for each person. The first three will be dedicated to, to each specialist. The other, the last two, will be more of a roundtable uh, discussion. But but we have 200 people in the audience, and we would love to hear from you. And so we want to get that done and leave 30 minutes for your questions. So in the chat box, please, uh, if you hear you have a question, uh, that's one of the things I like about uh, doing uh, Zoom broadcast type. Uh, panels, we can get all your questions and your thoughts as they occur, and you can even talk amongst each other. I've seen that on chats while I've been presenting. But if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, please indicate that. And then what we'll try and do is summarize when we get into that last 30 minutes and make sure your questions are, are being addressed. Um, what uh, I'm going to let, well, I, I like to name something unusual about each. I, I'll just name a, a couple things that are unusual. The uh, Peter Thomas is actually a, a uh, 
ultimate Frisbee player his whole life, and he owns the ultimate Frisbee team. He's one of the owners of the ultimate Frisbee team in uh, Atlanta. I thought that was pretty unique, pretty, un pretty unusual, and something I'm intrigued about. I was on the ultimate Frisbee team at Georgia Tech for about two months. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then uh, doc, Dr. Brass has a has a 150 students doing modeling, uh, and uh, that's really kind of exciting. I'm going to introduce him to my son, who's doing some modeling at Harvard right now. And then uh, Dr. Tom uh, Cunningham, he actually worked for the Federal Reserve uh, on, on policy decisions. <clears throat> so I think this is really an incredible panel that that um, that we have for you today with some really unique individuals. Um, that, that have a lot to offer. So let's uh, move to the question part and I will let you introduce just briefly, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Peter Thomas, give us a little bit of your background. Sure, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist uh, with the Centers for Disease Control since about 2002. And I have been um, working uh, in various levels, uh, various areas of disease. I was an epidemic intelligence service officer in Washington, D.C. for a few years, and they are the first responders to many of the outbreaks and epidemics of the state, of the country. And I've worked in um, domestic HIV uh, and uh, recently was overseas uh, working on malaria for several years in, in Africa. And now what I do is I help train uh, ministries of Health. I work with the Ministries of Health in several countries uh, to train um, epidemiologists and health professionals to respond to outbreaks. And uh, as a U.S. Public Health Service officer, uh, I am on call 24-7 to respond and, and fail to make assistance to any health issues. Okay, and uh, Dr. Brad Bass? Hi, uh, I have 30 plus years uh, in the environmental field. My training is in geography, and it was both on the economic and the environmental side. And my work has spanned climate change, um, economics, Great Lakes, water quality, uh, various technologies, as well as modeling. Uh, just to make the correction, I, I don't have 150 students yet. We're about 110. <laughs> and they are working with me. They are doing mo uh, they're applying my software in all sorts of areas, many of them far beyond the environment and far beyond what I would have ever envisaged. They're, they're I think, much brighter than I am. Gives us a lot of hope for the future. And um, Dr. Tom Cunningham. Hi. Um, I got drafted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta right out of grad school. I'm an open economy macroeconomist and monetary theory person by training. I spent 30 years uh, doing monetary policy and open economy macro and regional analysis. I uh, retired and got drafted by the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Um, Metro Atlanta is an economy about the, well, a little bit bigger than Norway's. And, and so kind of treating it as an open economy works pretty well. Um, and, you know, the, just in terms of being able to give something back to the community, uh, it's been pretty rewarding and I still get to do stuff like this. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the questions that we had is what regions of the world are represented uh, here? And it's, it's pretty broad because uh, Peter serves the whole world in his role uh, and uh, the climate spreads from Canada. I mean, it's everywhere, right? So I think we've got uh, most of the most of the this continent uh, covered, but we also are dealing with people that serve abroad uh, on a constant basis. Um, so I'm going to start with the questions with the epidemiologist. Um, first question, Peter, is given the global population size and connectivity, could we be entering a pandemic age where we see more than the usual uh, global pandemics as a as a new norm. Thanks, Bill. Um, just a quick housekeeping issue. I want to just make sure that uh, that I state that my views and opinions expressed are my own, and as a public health epidemiologist, and not necessarily represent the CDC or the U.S. Public Health Service. 
Um, with that said, um, yeah, well, well, one of the uh, one flu epidemic every 100 years, you know, I wouldn't characterize as, you know, being, you know, a lot. Uh, if we talk about the last pandemic flu, but most certainly. Certainly, it's very real. Um, I wouldn't call it a norm, but as you stated in the question, the increased global movement, increased urbanization, and don't forget, you know, the issues of the global warming and the climate change. They certainly um, have are going to have and and do have an impact um, on conditions that are make us ripe for uh, a pandemic. But with that said, there. Are, a lot of other variables um, in the equation that can contribute and explain increases in pandemics, uh, including increasing opportunities for mutations from animal reservoirs uh, to, to infect susceptible and naive populations. So epidemics such as SARS and MERS and Ebola seem to be more prevalent. Note that I said epidemics and not pandemics because um, many of these recent health crises are just, quote, unquote, just pan, uh, epidemics and haven't risen to the pandemic stage uh, or level yet. Um, uh, in the US, you have to also uh, put into the equation that there is an increased, seemingly increased reluctance to immunize against pathogens like the flu. And so all of those factors are gonna, you know, contribute to opportunities for pandemics. One big issue is the novel pathogens like corona. Um, but also another one is the not novel pathogens like Zika, the Zika virus, which was first identified in Uganda in 1947 in monkeys and later identified in humans in 1952 in Uganda and was in Africa and Asia, but it didn't really become a, a threat to um, you know global global threat until it reached a naive population in the, in the Americas. So um, the, there are you know pathogens out there that exist but haven't reached a, a pool of people that would that could cause havoc. A yellow fever is another example that um, we don't immunize for in a lot of areas of the country and if it reached of the world and if it reached Asia, it would, you know, could be a, a big problem. And, and finally, uh, oh, you just need to take in consideration the mode of transmission. The, the different modes of transmission are going to affect the ability for pandemics. Um, the airborne's are, would be one that would be much more, uh, you know, infectious and ca catastrophic, but the pandemics like HIV AIDS you know, are spread sexually. So um, whether or not we're going to have an increase in pandemics is or has to take all of those things in, into consideration. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are the range of pandemic types, which I think you just covered, we could see in the future? So you've almost answered question two, but you, is there anything in addition to that, that what we might see coming down the line? You know, we're going to see the same types of, 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 of diseases, the zoonotic diseases, which are about six zoonotic, meaning that the um, illnesses are, are caused by germs that are passed between animals and people. Um, they account for about six of every 10 infectious diseases. Um, but there are also the arboviruses, which is, you know, includes the mosquitoes, the, the fleas, the ticks, uh, and of course, the airborne things like pneumonic plague are the types of pandemics that, uh, that we, can, we can come to. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we've seen those all before. So I don't think that, uh, that I'm not, we're not, the biggest threat aren't from the, the novel, you know, a new type of spread. It's just a new diseases that can uh, become um, prevalent and more transmissible. What, you know, what is the range of response we need to be ready to implement to, to mitigate the spread of the pandemic? So the range of responses are um, pretty much what we know today to do, which is if you have a, um, an 
epidemic or a pandemic, you want to isolate uh, the, someone who's infected, you want to track uh, that infection um, and treat the infected so that you know contact tracing is possible because you have you know isolated the source, you've tracked where they've been, and you're treating the person who um, is infected and could be infectious. But the other side of the, the response is, you know, addressing risk behavior and risk communication. Often the, the last elements to be prioritized, but uh, in, in, you know, response campaigns, but <clears throat> to adequately fight an outbreak, um, you're, you're going to be ineffective without a good risk communication uh, campaign. And the communication piece is not just the words or the medium used to get the message out, but how effectively the message is conveyed, uh, the information is conveyed that reinforces enforces or, or establishes trust be between the responders, which is often the government and the people. Without the trust information, uh, without trust, information is just words, right? And, sure. um, and sounds. And so you, if you want people to interrupt their, you know, generation, generations of cultural practices like burial practice in West Africa, or you want them to trust that wearing a mask is going to make a meaningful difference in the COVID spread and not just a loss of liberty, the, the way that you communicate it uh, is critical. And, and finally, I, I would say that surveillance is, has to be a piece of that pie because you have to detect that something is unusual and then the response, you know, if it's big, it has to be coordinated and end early so that um, you can have an impact on the ongoing um, threat over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, uh, that trust in the government, as I, I talked earlier, is, could be a challenge in the U.S. at some times. Um, and so it's, it's, it's in some of the countries that have addressed it quicker, they have a robust um, healthcare system that the uh, population in general trust the directions they're given. Uh, so it's, some, it's, it's definitely something we have to work on culturally. A lot of these things are cultural uh, issues that need to be addressed. So moving on to the environmentalist, uh, during the global shutdown, Brad, are we seeing any impact to our global environment? Did, did, uh, you know, did we see air quality improve? If so, how much? <laughs> So let me, um, <laughs> let me talk about everything but air quality for a moment, because air quality has been the sort of most prevalent environmental issue under discussion since the lockdown. Uh, let's talk about water quality. So we have to realize we are in the midst of a grand experiment uh, of likes we've never seen, and we can learn a lot from it. One of the things we've been learning is, one, the virus does survive in the water. It's been found in wastewater. It's not necessarily dangerous. There's no advisories against, you know, turning on your tap. What I think it really teaches us is perhaps there was an early warning signal that we missed. And perhaps that could be used for future epidemics or future pandemics. So surveillance, uh, although it's not the same as monitoring people, but there may be some larger scale surveillance available because of the water. If you go to the cities, uh, walk around your city, if you can go downtown, walk around the downtown, I think you'll notice something, two things. One, quiet. So the amount of noise pollution in Toronto, and not just downtown Toronto, on any of the main streets, could qualify as uh, damaging uh, for hearing. The other, uh, so reducing that is, is a real, it's a real benefit. Uh, you know, we may not realize it, but it is a real benefit. I, I, I can hear the birds every morning. You know, I can really spend time listening to that. In addition to noise pollution, when you look down on the street, one thing that you'll probably see less of is garbage. So, uh, now that may not be worldwide yet, but I think we'll see that at least in many of the Western cities. And one thing you know, in, in many cities, when I used to walk downtown, if it was really hot, I used to walk by those open doors of the stores because I knew they'd be air conditioning the sidewalk, which is a tremendous loss of uh, waste of energy. It's a tremendous waste of uh, any of the resources you're using uh, for cooling or I guess in the winter heating. 
It's not going on now. Uh, now that also means the businesses are closed down, which is not good, but this, it's, we're still using less energy uh, than we did before in many sectors. Uh, there, although I don't think it's been anything more than anecdotal yet, we, we think there's been a decline in shipping, which may have a positive impact on marine life. Don't know yet. You know, that's one of those things we'll have to, uh, we'll have to see when all the data is in. Air quality has, of course, been the most obvious um, issue uh, that we've noted, that we've been able to take a look at. And in the short term, yes, we've seen improvements in air quality across the world. We've seen the biggest indicator is nitrogen dioxide. It's gone down and part particulate matter, the little particles that get stuck in your lung, PM 2.5, uh, those levels have also gone down. PM 2.5 is extremely dangerous. And we, we found that in cities with high levels of PM 2.5, we've actually had more deaths uh, due to the virus. So reducing that has been a benefit. Uh, we've seen ozone go down. Now ozone uh, emerges as, um, uh, for a number of different reasons under uh, higher temperatures and emissions. The ironic thing is, as some of the nitrogen oxides have gone down, ozone's actually gone back up. It's just one of those perverse ironies in, in the chemistry of air quality. And of course, people want to make assumptions or assertions about climate change now that we've seen you know, a drop in emissions, and we're talking about on the order of 15 to 20% in greenhouse gas emissions, in large cities like Toronto. So you may think, wow, if we've cut those 20%, we must have seen a drop in greenhouse gas emissions. And actually we haven't. In a lot of places, they've kept going up because transportation uh, might be about one quarter at the most, of, account for about one quarter of, of emissions, which means there's still three quarters that's coming from somewhere else. And a lot of those other activities may not have declined to the same extent. But Overall, there's definitely been a short-term improvement in air quality, uh, and we've, it's been noted uh, in most of the major industrialized countries. Yeah, and you, what you were saying earlier is that the, uh, the truck traffic that gets the uh, shipment around is mostly diesel-driven, and we've, are, we've adapted cars to higher efficiency, so we, they've already gotten a little cleaner. We've gotten them off the road, so we didn't see as a big of an impact because what was left on the road were the were the heavier polluters. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Now I did look at the data. The, the the number of trucks on the road has gone down, but not to the same extent as the cars. Yeah. And so we still have the truck transport. Um, I mean, we all want that Amazon delivery the next day. Well, <laughs> that takes energy. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's not then they're not all delivered by drones. Uh, so I, I think I think we have to realize that we've seen some gains, but uh, they're not as dramatic as we might have thought they were. Yeah, the the uh, last question because I bundled those two. Uh, what environmental lessons can we take away from this from the shutdown, if any? I I think the biggest lesson we can take is that we can do this. There's a behavior change that we went through very quickly. And it was a very dramatic change in behavior. We found we can live um, with less private transportation. Everyone I've talked to has said, yes, they, they may go back to work, but no one wants to go back five days a week. Everyone is prepared to work part-time from home. That could have, uh, that should have a permanent impact, even if it's a small impact on air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so I think when we start to move on other issues and say people will never do that, people won't accept that, I think we can now make the argument, no, we've seen uh, people accept quite a change and do it over a weekend. And to me, that was incredible. We've also now, the other lesson is, um, Many large organizations have severe weather plans, climate change plans, something they're going to put into effect if they have to. And the assumption always was that there was a time element involved. They couldn't do it in a day. And basically, you know, I went into work on Monday, March 17th. 
there were a few of us in the building, some, some, most of us got the message, I just didn't, that we don't have to come in. The next day we we're all working at home. There was, it took one day. So I think from an organizational perspective, we know that we can cope with, uh, we can put these plans into place and now implement them basically on a day's notice. Yeah, yeah, quite amazing. So I'm going to turn over to the economy, which, you know, this is a land economics uh, organization. So this is where a lot of us uh, do our research. This is where a lot of us make our living. There's a lot of us uh, practice, uh, you know, the principles of planning and design. Uh, but it's the economy is, uh, you know, keeps us alive, keeps us going. So what's the potential economic impact from the global shutdown, uh, Tom? Um, potentially huge. We don't really know. And I want to be kind of careful about being explicit about the kind of depth of fundamental uncertainty about the economy right now. Um, actually, prior to the pandemic, when I was talking to Bill's group in Atlanta, the, one of the prime messages I had was, expansions don't die of old age. Something has to kill them. And what kills them in our lifetime has been um, either public or private sector mistakes, that some sector has done something weird and or you know, um, unsustainable and, and things kind of fell apart from there. People lost jobs, they lost confidence in their income streams, they stopped consuming and the expansions kind of moved out uh, from, from whatever the local disruption was. That's not the case here at all. That here, this is sort of uh, in an extraordinarily short period of time, uh, the economy just getting slammed getting slammed globally, that this, ex this expansion ended basically in a month. Um, we went from, a, a, if anything, a, a booming economy, perhaps over full employment, uh, to in the United States, about 17% unemployment, much higher than it was during the depth of the, of the Great Recession, which was the worst recession we'd had since the Great Depression. And we did that in one month. Um, that's something that's just never happened before. Um, and, it's, and it's happened globally. Uh, usually, you know, there are specific economies that slow down first and then there's sort of this contagion that moves from there, an economic contagion. It's probably a bad term in this context to use. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is that, you know, the uncertainties associated with the pandemic have really been incredibly disruptive for the the global economy. And one of the things that my former colleagues at, at the Fed make a big point of saying over and over again is that in terms of the actual, you know, economic disruption, we have tools that are in place that can deal with, with deficiencies in demand and, and getting back, getting people, you know, income so they can go back into the stores or you know, go back to work in factories and offices. That's, that's the typical recession. This time the problem is just the opposite, that we had something that stopped us from going into the offices and the factories and the stores and, and the, the restaurants. And that's a situation unlike anything we've ever seen, um, certainly in our lifetimes. Um, and so to the extent that, that uncertainties remain about the kind of course of the virus, the course of the pandemic, um, there is a very deep uncertainty about how the course of, of the economy is going to, to move forward. And one of the things, you know, Brad was talking about modeling, and of course, economists do that all the time. And one of the kind of odd things going on right now in terms of modeling is that there's much more uncertainty about our short-term outlook than our longer-term outlook. Um, you know, longer term, we know that productivity comes from innovation, investment, and, and uh, workforce growth, and those fundamentals really haven't changed. One of the things that I think is a useful observation and, and may, you know, uh, be a teeing off point for, for the next couple of questions is that one of the things that this pandemic has done for the, the, the business community 
is hasten a lot of things that were going to happen otherwise. You know, when we talk about kind of working at home or working remotely, we all kind of knew that that stuff was going to come. Um, it's just that it showed up in one day, as, as Brad said, in, instead of over a course of a number of years. When we look at kind of retail establishments, when we knew that, you know, kind of smaller retail establishments that didn't have a, an online presence were in real trouble. Um, and that they were going to get hit hard by kind of inevitable economic forces. Uh, those economic forces showed up really fast all at once. And, you know, the, an, uh, another good example of this is the move towards autonomous vehicles. When we think about sort of issues of, of logistics and uh, supply chain issues, um, you know, things that we were thinking about doing, kind of getting a better um, sense of what our supply chain actually looked like um, and, and how to manage it. Those issues uh, stopped being something that we needed to do in the short run and started to be something that we needed to do right now. And, and so kind of the issues of sort of using autonomous vehicles to better manage, uh, you know, delivery processes, looking at supply chains uh, with an eye towards reliability of offshore uh, sourcing and, and kind of what that means for onshoring and um, future investment. All of that um, are things that we thought were gonna happen over time. Uh, they're just happening really quickly. Um, you know, in the, in the near term, we, you know, to the extent that, that we get a better understanding of the risks and, and problems associated with managing the pandemic, uh, the economy can, can reopen and, and uh, you know, recover. Uh, the problem isn't, again, kind of the traditional recession, what to do to get people back in stores. Uh, the problem is a public health problem. And un until confidence that that is um, well in hand is restored, um, you know, we, we have a short-term problem with, with economic disruption. Does that explain what some of what we're seeing in the stock market then to a certain degree, I would imagine? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, an awful lot of the volatility in, in um, equity markets has to do with, with relatively low interest rates and, and so consequently a high discount rate that just leads to volatility. Um, but again, you know, if, if somehow the virus were somehow to magically go away tomorrow and everybody uh, had confidence that it was gone completely, I, I think the economy would rebound relatively quickly. Um, that again, isn't the real problem. The, the fundamental problem is uh, the, the public health issue. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, not far from my house is the Battery, which has a large entertainment district, high-density high entertainment district. And uh, the, the, I went over there probably a month and a half after they shut everything shut down when they first started allowing restaurants to open up in a certain way. And I just went over to pick up takeout. Uh, one of our favorite restaurants was opening back up. And it was crowded. And no, people weren't wearing masks. And it was, it kind of, it kind of comforted my fears at the same time as I've, I thought that people were really dumb, but it comforted my fears that, uh, you know, we're not going to get back, back, back to normal is going to be, people are going to still want to congregate. They're going to still want to come together in cities because we're social animals and uh, we just need to do it in a smart way, especially during a, a pandemic. Now it, had, it hasn't persisted like that over there. I went back uh, uh, not too long ago and, and, and it was, everybody was social distancing and wearing masks and, felt a little better about uh, the culture I'm in. Um, so I have one last question. You kind of set it up, but well, it's a double question. Let me, as, as a, um, there's probably a bunch of people that are cyclists on this, on this line. As a cyclist, I was excited about the roads being cleared up and, uh, you know, alternative transportation, actually more leisure time. I just read an article yesterday that bike sales have accelerated by 31% this year. Um, they can't get, they can't make enough of them. And, but my question became, because I also study economics and my whole career, 
I've tried to get people out of cars and into walkable environments. Um, and that happened, you know, relatively quickly, but at the same time, I saw how powerful the automotive economy was, the, the road building economy was, and, the, and, and what an economic engine it's been for our culture for so long. So if we, if we change that behavior, um, is that gonna be good or bad for the economy? I, 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 just a question I had, I didn't know the scale, the economics that we get out of, the, our, out of our auto dependency which I'm not for, I'm just curious about the economic impact of that shift, if that were to happen. Yeah, I, I think, again, this is one of those things that we're hastening something that was coming all, all along. Um, one of the uncertainties in the short run that, that um, I'm very concerned about right now is a lack of confidence in public transit that um, I'm, I'm worried and, and watching carefully a lot of mobility statistics that are suggesting that as economies open up again, it's much more auto dependent than it was mass transit dependent. And, and that's worrisome, although I don't think that's a long-term trend. I think in the longer term, we're seeing kind of, you know, live work environments that have been more integrated in a, in a serious way. Um, We've certainly seen an issue related to sort of autonomous vehicles and what that means for the auto industry. And, you know, the reason everybody's jumping on it is because there, there is just this sort of you know, fundamental issue about a major asset in an in, in individual's portfolio that sits idle 23 hours a day. Um, and that doesn't have to be the case with uh, appropriate technology. And hastening that technology is something that um, this pandemic is going to do. Smart cities initiatives that uh, facilitate um, improved, well, just improved traffic flow, period, but also f to facilitate autonomous vehicles can really bring down the, the ratio of, of um, cars to people. Um, you know, we're also seeing this in, in you know, architecture period that um, you know, we're seeing a, a substantial uh, realignment of, of what's in demand that clearly for office workers, a, a large share of, a, or not a large, but a significant share, notable share of, of office workers um, are working remotely. Um, that is something that, you know, has been sort of a, a dream for a lot of people for a while, um, but the whole issue of uh, kind of the need for greater um, uh, warehouse space, greater need for um, you know attention to logistics and supply chain management, um, greater need for um, kind of ad hoc manufacturing as we uh, examine supply chains and bring some stuff back on shore in terms of manufacturing. All of these things are, are um, kind of things that were happening slowly anyway, and, and the movement isn't so slow anymore. Yeah, yeah. you had mentioned there's capital that is willing to invest in some of these things quicker now uh, because they could see the, the need transforming. And just yeah. you know, me as having my own office, we doubled our size in the past five years, and I was looking at buying more real estate, and I'm like, I'm not going to buy more real estate. I'm going to redesign what I got to be collaborative and let people work at home and I can grow without more real estate asset, right? So a lot of people got to be thinking that way right now. Um, so I think that was that you, you kind of hedged into the last question I had for the economist, but in case there's more, I want to ask it. And, and, and the fact that we are a land economics group, um, you know, what, what is the impact of the real estate industry? And I know you, you, you hit on it a little bit with manufacturing and office, but if there's anything more you want to expand on the impact of the pandemic to the real estate industry, I, I think our audience would be really interested. Okay. Well, I think the office um, kind of changes are, are the, going to be the most dramatic. I mean, one of the things that I think we've seen is, um, you know, the need for more office space per person uh, rather than kind of the crowding that we have seen in, in kind of uh, the collaborative spaces that, that have been fashionable recently, that, that looks like it's changing. Um, you know, on the flip side, there are going to be less people in offices. 
Uh, so, you know, the, it's not quite clear what the net effect on that is, although I'd bet on there being uh, less, less uh, office demand. Um, one of the big issues are, are just simple logistics of, of a large building. You know, um, for some large office buildings, if we do appropriate social distancing, um, it'll take hours to load the building and unload the building due to um, elevator constraints. Um, this, is, this is a real issue for, for firms that uh, have workers that, that can work at home. The issue of, of you know, why you would want to come in is, is uh, you know, kind of serious. And so I think the, for, a, again, a large share of, of the workforce, um, the work at home option is going to be the dominant thing and uh, we're just not going to go back to the same kind of offices that we have in the past. Um, we can't overemphasize, I think, uh, the change in, in supply chain management. Um, you know, the, the issue of, you know, where stuff is coming from and how it gets to where it's going uh, is fundamentally being readdressed and reassessed. Um, this means, you know, not just, um, you know, kind of re-examining stuff, but the issue is what do we do, you know, in, in terms of location and, and, you know, ultimate sources for manufacturing. And one, one of the kind of amusing things that we've seen um, as firms look for kind of redundant sourcing for, for key components is that you may have three or four suppliers offshore that are capable of delivering the good but those three or four suppliers are all dependent on one um, intermediate goods supplier further down the supply chain that you as a manufacturer just weren't aware of. Um, and now you need to be aware of that. And that will cause some repositioning of, of manufacturing um, capacity around, um, um, you know, or, around the globe. Um, it's also, you know, the case that that um, kind of repurposing um, kind of deliveries and, and warehouses set up to facilitate those deliveries is something that, that's going to require an awful lot of um, attention from the commercial real estate industry. Um, and, and finally, one of the things that I, I don't think is permanent, but certainly has shown up in a, in a major way recently is, is a shift to single family housing. Um, you know, single family housing is, is booming right now. Um, how much of that is pent up demand and how much of that is, you know, a shift, a permanent shift as a consequence of people being uh, uneasy about multifamily or, or dense dwelling, I, I, I can't say. Um, but it certainly is something that people are aware of um, and, and may have long term implications for the real estate industry. Do you think part of that, or is it both uh, boomers as well as millennials becoming uh, more of age, of children age, and uh, buying their first homes and getting out of the apartments, or is it both? You're seeing that both in baby boomers and yeah, that's 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 tough to to um, measure. I mean, it certainly was the case that millennials delayed um, moving into single family homes, and so the kind of you know as as I talked to the the major single family constructors, builders around the, uh, the country, um, their sense was that this was a timing issue, that, you know, the, they were kind of, the, the millennials were sort of skipping over the starter home and moving directly uh, and staying in multifamily until they, they started a family. Um, that led to the last decade of single family home construction lagging household formation, which is just not sustainable. Um, and how much of this is, uh, how much of the boom currently is, you know, that just a matter of pent up demand and people, you know, pulling the trigger when they thought about doing it for a long time and now they're actually gonna do it. Um, I don't know. Um, and how much of this is a long-term shift and, you know, I, I, again, I'm, it, it's not really clear, but I do think that's something we have to watch. Yeah, I've heard, and the interest rates are good, but it's still harder to qualify for some people. So rental single family is, an, is another market that seems to be expanding. 
Well, and you're certainly seeing private equity uh, yeah. move into single family rental in a, in a major way. Uh, that's, that's a major source of, of uh, new home construction finance. All right, so there's some great questions on the economy coming in. We'll get to, uh, if I keep to the schedule, it looks like I'm keeping exactly to the schedule, which is awesome. So we have the uh, last two questions, which are more of a round table. Uh, and they have to do with, you know, I kept, I kept thinking, you know, this generation is more connected than any generation that, that would ever been on earth uh, with all the uh, technology we have. And here we are, the whole world's focused on the same issue. So that's got to kind of raise our collective conscious and, and our way to connect with each other as a, as a globe, like we've never seen it before. So I th that was part of my thinking behind this title of Pandemic Awakening, we're, we're awakening and we're connected while we're awakening. I did not and should have seen it coming because uh, we've certainly been talking about it and it's been bubbling under the surface. The social uh, justice issue has really emerged as kind of the first thing coming here from the United States. And I know this is a global population, but it was, it was actually heartwarming to see the whole world, uh, you know, um, get out and protest and and support, uh, you know, the the the, the issues that um, many of our folks are dealing with. And I, I also think the pandemic uh, exposed some underserved areas, like it accelerated some some growth corridors we saw coming, but it also exposed some weaknesses in our in our uh, system, and particularly in um, you know social equity uh, issues and poverty and the health of certain segments of our population that haven't been. So the last two questions kind of get at that, you know, that I want to end on a positive note. So I got a second uh, question to those two questions, but, but it's serious stuff. And we, I think we need to talk about it and we need to address it going forward. And the world has basically asked everybody to address it. Um, so I'll, I'll start with, um, well, I'm going to start with Peter on this one, but I'm going to go, each question is going to go around. I got two questions that are just going to go around to each of them. Have population segments been affected differently? And I, I, I mentioned the USA, but we do have a global audience. So uh, I would like to hear about it in the US, but I also don't mind you expand, you know, expand from your health perspective, your global health perspective you have as well. But, you know, have different populations been affected differently by the pandemic? Hey, um, yes, uh, in a word, um, and you know, you to answer it globally and in America it requires you know two different kind of answers. I'll, I'll start globally because it's easier to say that the pandemic globally, uh, well, in Africa specifically because it started um, outside of the United States, but where I work uh, in the African countries, the the pandemic is peaking, uh, that first peak is still, um, is still rising. And um, there, there are a lot of concerns uh, about, um, you know, what that peak will, will mean, not just for health, but for, you know, security issues. Um, one thing that, uh, swing it back to, to America, uh, that the, uh, some of the African countries did that, the U.S. didn't do uh, is, you know, establish a very strict, you know, um, quarantine system for anyone coming in and out. We shut our borders to, to some countries, you know, after, uh, somewhat after the fact because we were hit first. But some of these uh, African countries have done a really good job of quarantining anyone coming in, shutting down the major cities, and really ex exerting a kind of control that you know, you know, probably Americans wouldn't be excited about, but it has been effective in you know maintaining a low transmission. Um, in America, uh, absolutely, the, there's been different population segments affected, and in minority populations, the, the data is uh, clear have you know suffered are suffering more than other populations, and um, that is, you know, can be attributed to a couple of things. One is that um, these, you know, um, minority populations are more likely to be frontline workers. So they have these low wage jobs that they didn't have an option to stay home and they can't work from home, whether it's at the grocery store or at the factory. Um, 
that that's one exposure. Two is that they have had pre-existing conditions. So African-American populations are, are more likely to have uh, heart diseases and, and diabetes and, and other um, existing conditions that make them more vulnerable to uh, COVID. And um, lastly, they don't have uh, access to care. And this is a big one because uh, if you can't get tested or you don't can't take off to go to the, to the uh, hospital, or if you go to the hospital and it means that you need to spend money for care, you're not likely, you're not likely to go or you cannot go. So all those things um, combined really have made, you know, conditions ripe for African-American and minority populations to be more vulnerable and to die at a higher rates than other populations. Yeah, I, I couldn't help but think during this, if we had a robust public health care option, you know, that I, I really wonder at some point, I would like to look at a study of countries that had a robust public health care option compared to countries that did it and how, how they were, how quick they were able to respond. Um, and, and that didn't really touch on, you know, what you started off with, which is the, the idea of the, the racial uh, anxiety and unrest, which it was just the cream on top of COVID uh, that, you know, exacerbated things. But that's a whole, you know, different topic on, you know, the bubbling over of people who were feeling disadvantaged and, you know, their uh, kind of overlooking the threat of COVID because of a, of a higher threat or what they perceive as a bigger threat to their survival and their, their welfare. Yeah, yeah. The, um, from the environmental perspective, have we seen uh, population segments that have been more affected differently in, in, in the U.S. and elsewhere? Uh, so what we have seen is an urban-rural divide or, an, or, or perhaps a, and, and I hate to say it's a big champion of this, um, you know, perhaps a, as densities get higher, more a higher risk of, of, um, of getting infected. Uh, in Ontario, uh, we kept a statistic. I'm glad we did, but nobody, I don't think anybody else kept the statistic. And they looked at all the, the diversity of our neighborhoods and they found that this is after adjusting for age structure, the rate of infections in the most diverse neighborhoods was three times higher than the rate in the least diverse neighborhoods. And they were also, uh, these neighborhoods, people were likely to experience severe outcomes, more severe outcomes in terms of hospitalizations, uh, ICU admissions, and death rates. I live in one of those areas. <laughs> uh, not surprisingly, um, I'm one of the three areas in the province that's still in what we call phase two. We won't be moving in, into phase three. Now, it, this is, it's not a cause, it's a correlation. Of course, the most diverse areas in Ontario, except for one case, happen to be the largest cities, the largest urban areas. Again, that's not so surprising. So there really is this, uh, but the diversity gives us an indicator. Instead of looking at density, instead of looking at um, you know, you know, um, the fact whether it's city or rural, let's just look at diversity and it just hits you right away. Um, but, but I would say, at least within in Ontario, that, that is definitely an rural, uh, rural, rural urban divide. <laughs> now, when you look at the other parts of the world, like you look at countries like India, China, where they've had some great um, successes in China in, in air quality, for example. But again, you see the, the large cities that are, have very dense populations, the people are most at risk. Uh, in, in those areas just because of the, the interactions both at home and outside of the home. Uh, you know, where, where you go home and you're with a lot of people and you go out of the home and you're with a lot of people. Looking at the U.S., a real envir interesting environmental thing is you can compare ozone declines in the U.S. I have my map in front of me and, and I can see that, you know, the, the largest um, area of decline, you're talking about 20 percent or more, was in I guess the middle of California, you know, LA had about a 14% decline, but Santa Barbara would have been more like a 20% decline and north of that area. Uh, Pittsburgh, 9% less ozone, Houston, 12%. Uh, so Houston, um, 
Houston and Pittsburgh, similar in many ways, LA a little bit better. Uh, but when I look at the total map of the US, the area that really pops out is California. That's where you've seen the, you know, the biggest improvements in air quality. But again, that's where you had probably the highest density of, of drivers. So again, this perhaps is not the big surprise. The big surprise for me in air quality was what I'm not seeing in New York City. So I'm not seeing uh, what I would call a measurable decline in ozone in the New York City area. Uh, so there are some things left to explain, but, um, but basically I think I have to take one message here. There's definitely a, a rural urban divide or density, non-density divide. Yeah, yeah. And that's a big question for a lot of our uh, urbanists and we, I see that in the Q&A section coming up. Well, I'm one I of them. You know, I, I do have an answer, but you know, I just wanted to yeah, we'll, make the we'll make talk more, about more that. severe. I keep, yeah. I keep thinking about what Olmsted did so long ago, but we won't go into that now. Um, so on the on the come from the economy side, which is a lot of the I think the root of the, un, of the unhealthy uh, population, but the the uh, has certain economic uh, segments been affected differently in the U.S. Yes, um, the so-called uh, essential workers. Um, have been hit the hardest. Um, I, essentially, I was actually on a, a group, a task force that worked on this um, about a decade ago, looking at um, what we called essential workers. That those are not unskilled, but relatively low skilled uh, service sector jobs that that cannot be exported. Um, so they're things like you know hospital orderlies or, you know, people in the um, kitchen, not, not the chefs, but kitchens and restaurants. And um, it, it turns out that, you know, kind of uh, housekeepers in hotels, that that's a little over 20% of the workforce. Um, I was kind of surprised at, at how large that turned out to be. And it doesn't vary very much across the, the country, that ratio. Um, they got hit the hardest. Um, they're relatively low income jobs. And so one of the things that we saw when um, the pandemic struck was a, a real sharp increase in uh, average take home pay because all the low income people were, were laid off. Um, that's um, troubling to, to put it mildly that you know this is a, a distressed uh, population to begin with and to see um, a, such a disproportionate uh, share of, of layoffs occurring there that it really moved the the median uh, wage numbers was uh, was pretty revealing um, i think this is going to have some real implications in the housing market particularly as uh, eviction moratoriums get lifted. Um, you know, the, there's an enormous problem there. And, and it's really incredibly unfortunate that it falls on a disadvantaged population, falls disproportionately on a disadvantaged population. Because by and large, the people that were hit by this were, they didn't really do anything wrong. Um, they just don't have the economic means to sustain themselves in a kind of zero income environment for a long period of time. And they are essential for the well-being of, of the, the economy in the long run. Um, but they're going to have a, a very serious burden coming up here um, in the not too distant future as, as uh, you know, landlords and financial institutions um, assess how much forbearance they can, they can give. Yeah, I, you know, and I'm going to stick with you for the Final question, and then go back and ask the other uh, panelists in a discussion about you know what what can we do going forward? I was last year I was at, at the Link event and um, in Atlanta. We're up in Pittsburgh, and uh, it, ju it just dawned on me the economic studies I was looking at for the past five, say three to five years, has said the the only thing that'll solve this fundamentally good economy uh, is capacity, and I began to put in my head, put two and two together. I'm sure a lot of people did. Well, 
if the capacity is a problem, if human capacity is a problem, what an opportunity to lift people in poverty. You know, what an opportunity to lift uh, a, a whole generation of people because capacity is the issue for the economy to keep going. And so we were on that path, right? The country was on that path of lifting a lot of people out of poverty. And then this thing hit. I was like, oh, man. So, so my question is, what, what can we modify to improve the economic environment for those impacted the most? I mean, that's a, that's a tough, you know, com coming out of this. What can we do? What can well, I, I, I understand why you went to me first if you want to <laughs> end on a high note. Um, you know, this is, this is a real problem that um, in the last couple of years, wage gains in the lowest quintile of, of earners were the highest percentage. That is that a relatively tight labor market disproportionately helped low-income workers. Now, in a, in a sense, that's kind of easy because they weren't making very much money to begin with. So, you know, the yeah. same dollar increases a much larger percentage increase. But it is true that, that we were short on workers. Uh, we had been short on kind of the the high tech workers for a long time, their wage pressures were going up, but as the economy, uh, as the expansion grew more robust, the, the labor market pressures kind of crept down and over the last couple of years were really helping low income um, uh, workers. Um, you know, we at the Metro Chamber are very concerned about inclusive economic development. And when we look at Atlanta, one of the cases that we make is that, you know, helping lower income people um, and lower income populations uh, do better and, and achieve higher rates of economic mobility is, is a fundamentally good thing to do. But in the last couple of years, you could make the argument too that it helped everybody because we did have a shortage of workers. And so the idea that we were leaving large segments of our workforce underemployed, um, you know, it, it hurt them to be sure, but it hurt everybody else too. And I think we need to be very mindful of that going forward, that um, kind of the, the pressures that the business community put on um, kind of social institutions to kind of make sure that everybody had a shot um, at, at economic prosperity because that was necessary for the economy to continue functioning. We want to make sure that those pressures don't go away. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think now that there is a, an element of of, uh, well, I, I think the discussion has changed. And I, I think that that is um, much less likely to, to go away uh, with, with uh, more freely available um, workers. Uh, we recognize that this is a problem and we don't want to let up. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't. Yeah, good answer. Uh, so Brad, uh, if we... What can we modify in the human environment coming out of this? You know, if we learn something that take away to, to, to affect the, you know, to put us in a better uh, situation going forward. Yeah, so I think there are a few things to look at. One, uh, and I'll just build on an argument that Tom made. Um, we can look at redesigning our approach to work and the need uh, and how many people have to be in a certain place at a certain time which is what you've been trying to do for the last few years in your firm as well. I, I think that will have a tremendous impact. I think in general, not only is densification still a good idea in urban areas, uh, I don't think it maybe have become a sort of a bad word on the policy side, but I think that if for most people who enjoyed trips into the city, into those dense areas, uh, their social welfare has been impacted. You can measure the, their loss in social welfare as an economic loss. And that's why I think that uh, what we're seeing now is a short-term change that there will be, uh, it might not, uh, people willing to re-embrace urban density. They may want it done differently though. And so they may want designs that allow them to be in places where perhaps they don't have to be so close to everybody but they still want to be able to be in those 
denser urban areas because they're more exciting. You know, they're, the downtown urban street scene is, tends to be far more exciting than the suburban urban street scene. I think I'd rather be in downtown Toronto than in a sh the shopping mall in Mississauga. Um, so, and I think, I don't think I'm alone in that. And that's why I, I think that um, those things can come back. Perhaps one of the biggest issues, and, and we're, we're, we're running an experiment in Ontario, so maybe I can let you know, we have a regional transportation authority. It's called Go Transit. It gets me into the city. So there are two things are going on in Go Transit. One, face masks are mandatory. It's not an option. You don't get on the bus or the train without one. Two, um, they are now experimenting with some barriers to keep people apart. Uh, as they realize the crowds are going to increase again. So what they're thinking of is, hey, you know, we got to restore trust in our, in this service for people to come back or we can't sustain it. And I think, I think that's one of those, we have to rethink when people are moving, how they're going to move about. So we don't basically get everybody back in their car. Yeah. Um... You had mentioned something about, and I was trying to, I was grappling with it, trying to figure out what you, where it was coming from, but that you see a, a, a movement towards a green, more green roofs. You want to expand on that? Oh, well, the, I have to go back to one of Tom's um, predictions, not predictions, uh, findings, observations. So although the, the future demand for office space in the short term is, is mixed, um, so it may go down, it may stay the same we may see a, a larger demand for warehouses and factories. And part of this is a su the supply chain issue. When you put up a warehouse, you have a tremendous amount of roof space and same with a factory and your roof to wall ratio is much greater than it is for a house, for an office, for, for other types of buildings. When you can have that type of roof space, um, although it's the, enemy of densification, it's the friend of green roofs because you can put up tremendous roofscapes and those roofscapes can have tremendous social and environmental benefits. I'm a big advocate of green roofs. People who know me, I've, I've been in this, I've been in that field since it started. I helped start it in Ontario. So I, I, I really am a big advocate of this. And I really think that there's tremendous opportunity if we, if we take advantage of it. The easiest place to build a green roof is a warehouse. Yeah, yeah. So why not make them green roof ready and, and, and get those green roofs and then take advantage of the environmental and social benefits. There's also one other environmental economic opportunity. Uh, Tom alluded to, you know, changing supply chain thinking. So we can take, um, if I, I can think of the most, maybe one of the most critical elements of our supply chain that keeps us alive, it's phosphorus. Um, you can't live without it, can't grow plants without it. In North America, the amount of domestic phosphorus is for all intents and purposes zero. Hmm. Except we also have some of the best technology for recovering it from waste. Hmm. So there are opportunities as we rethink supply chains to really rethink uh, the basis of our manufacturing and these new technologies are very tie in very nicely to something called the circular economy. They take waste, they mine it, and they make it into a resource. Yeah. Well, that's going to go into a question that came from the audience. I'm going to flow into that. Uh, um, Tom, you, the question came from the audience, and you addressed it a little bit, but you had mentioned it uh, more earlier. What is the rethinking that's going on in manufacturing right now because of pandemic? You see there's a growth in manufacturing in the U.S., and, and uh, I was just trying to Help, help the audience and me connect the dots of what's going on there. Well, um, kind of two issues. Um, one is the supply chain itself. As I alluded to earlier, um, a lot of firms were not really aware of how shaky their supply chain really was in the sense that, you know, in, in terms of where the product was ultimately sourced, there, there may not have been the diversity that, that they thought there was. And consequently, if that one or, or two intermediate good manufacturer shuts off, um, you know, your four intermediate suppliers 
can't can't provide the stuff. Yeah. Um, and and so uh, kind of reshoring, um, or if, if not making the production domestic, at least making it newer or or someplace else more explicit um, is, is something that's going to happen. Um, in, in terms of actual onshoring, one of the big things we find in manufacturing is that technology really has advanced. And so, you know, manufacturing that is going to come back on shore, it's going to be extremely capital and technology intensive, very, very capital heavy. Um, interest rates are low right now. And, and so making investments in capital um, is a relatively attractive thing. And, and so, I mean, my kind of favorite example is um, here in Georgia, Caterpillar reshored a very heavy equipment manufacturing uh, plant uh, in North Georgia. And, and they're, they make cool stuff. I mean, it's just fun to go and see, you know, these huge earth movers and all that. But there, there really aren't any people in, in the factory that it's all robotic. Um, and there are some people there to be sure. Um, but the fact is that, that uh, it's very capital intensive, which means that for a number of manufacturers, the reason they went offshore in the first place was lower labor costs. But if labor isn't really an issue in, in manufacturing, and it certainly isn't to the extent that it had been even 10 years ago, uh, suddenly onshoring makes loads of sense. Um, and, and that's something that, that um, again, now that people are re-examining their supply chain, this is going to happen. Yeah, 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 that's very interesting. So, Peter, you're back. I'm glad we lost you there for a minute. <laughs> I'm going to go back to your closing uh, question I had right. before we get to the audience. We kind of wandered into the audience questions for a minute there. Um, what can we modify in, in to improve the human environment uh, uh, that affect, you know, from a health perspective? What, what, what do we have to do to take those populations that are underserved in the U.S. and elsewhere and really make a positive impact going forward so this, uh, we're, we're better prepared the next time around? So from a health perspective, um, you can't separate, you know, access to resources uh, from, you know, health care opportunities. And, you know, in, in one, if it, one stroke, you would say, um, you know, access to care, universal access to care. If you want to really affect these underserved populations, uh, you would address the things that determine uh, the difference in mortality. The biggest determinants are income and education. So if, if we want to uh, a short-term, uh, mid-term, you know, address access to care and universal healthcare opportunities, uh, long-term, we need to put in place things that are gonna build income and wealth. Uh, and that would be income, I mean, uh, that would be education and, and job opportunities. Because uh, in America, uh, I'm speaking for America, um, you know, the Latinos and, and African Americans make, uh, you know, on the dollar that white America makes, seventy-two cents and fifty-nine cents, respectively, for every dollar that the uh, white America would make. So um, you can't address it, you know, instantaneously. But to address health problems, you have to address access to resources, health care, and then income. Yeah, definitely, and and equity, and equity. When we work in neighborhoods like that, there are a lot of times they're afraid of gentrification. And what we try and do is take the ones we can and train them to uh, be developers, train them to be uh, micro developers and build social equity in the neighborhood. Uh, but you can't, that's hard to do for the people that are renting there. Um, and when the values increase, it's really hard. It's a whole other set of problems. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that the, we seem to be finally coming together and focusing on that. It's a little bit like one of those things Tom has said, and that we've been working on these things for a while, but this is kind of, the pandemic has accelerated and made it, you know, more urgent that we address, we address some of these issues. That's my, my hope going forward. So we had some really great questions, and I'm going to 
the biggest one that I that uh, I, I didn't even think of, and should as soon as I, you know, good question. As soon as you read it, you you say, "Oh my God, yeah, that's a great question. Why did I ask ask that question?" It's an economic question, so it's uh, definitely out of my uh, wheelhouse. But are, what do we do about uh, an era? Are we entering in a, an era of excessive debt uh, with the the bailout programs, or you want to call them, that's going on right now around the world, keeping the economy going through stimulus, uh, people taking on debt to keep going. Is there is there any issues with a economy that has greater debt than it than it's had uh, in a while? And are we entering? Is that actually happening? So I think it's a great question. Uh, seemed when I read it, and wanted to make sure I asked Tom. Um, well, potentially, yeah. Uh, there is a spectacular book, in, in, in my humble opinion, called This Time is Different by Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff that talk about financial crises. And the reason the title is This Time is Different is because this time isn't different. They're all the same. Um, but it's a pretty comprehensive history. There's only been about 700 years of, of finance, and so they go through all the debt crises. And if you get the book on tape, don't listen to it while you're driving because <laughs> nothing good will happen. Um, but, you know, the, the issue is kind of debt to income ratios. And while the U.S. is running up an enormous amount of debt, um, its overall debt to income ratio is, is not uh, particularly high that uh, we were at about 100% debt to income. Um, we are building that up quite quickly. But if you think about sovereign debt, sovereigns have a long time to pay off the debt um, over time. Um, and more importantly, in, in terms of just sort of managing debt, if we think about it on a personal level, when, when we buy a house, um, you know, we're comfortable with a three times debt to income ratio uh, personally before things get tough to manage on a cash flow side. Um, you know, we're nowhere near that nationally. Moreover, um, interest rates are very low. The capital is quite abundant. And that really doesn't have anything to do with um, the current situation. The world interest rates, global interest rates have been low for a long period of time. Uh, this isn't something that is unique to the United States. And in fact, prior to the pandemic, um, Germany was able to issue sovereign debt at a negative interest rate. And, and that's something we've just never seen before. I mean, when I was in graduate school, we didn't talk about negative interest rates until the third or fourth pitcher of beer. That, that <laughs> just wasn't something that was contemplated. And yet Germany was able to do that. And, and that confronted German policymakers with a very serious question. And that is, shouldn't they take on more debt? That if they are literally being compensated for issuing debt, it, it's not like all the bridges everywhere are in perfect shape. Taking on more debt would, would have socially beneficial consequences for a long period of time to come. Um, and aside from the fact that, you, that you know, the government's making money off this. Um, yeah. The same basic argument is true in the US that, you know, you want to be careful about what you are spending the money on. Um, but to the extent that you are avoiding, you know, some sort of calamity um, that would be very difficult to recover from, um, you know, the, the taking on more debt when we are at a place where it's very manageable and the um, world is, is more than willing to finance it, uh, that doesn't seem particularly risky. Um, we don't wanna make that you know, a, a policy that will go on ad infinitum. But at the moment, um, I'm, I'm uh, not, not wildly worried about where we are. Well, that's good to hear, that's good to hear. Uh, and the uh, other question, we got another 10 minutes. I probably got a two or three more questions and we'll kind of summarize and wrap it up and talk about next steps. Um, yeah, we, we hit on it a few times, but I think it's worth uh, talking about and it, it may 
uh, start with Brad, but f feel free to pitch in anybody. It's, it's that, I'm gonna ask the density question again in the urban uh, mm -hmm. environment. Uh, a lot of it, it's where I make my living as a urban planner. Uh, and so, and you know, we're, we, we are finishing up a plan for, uh, for College Park, 350 acres. And I said, let's make it a pandemic response. And we, I was talking to epidemiologists. We added a lot, outdoor, a lot of outdoor space. We had a 50 foot sidewalk. We added courtyards. We added green roofs that people go on and basically trying to get people outside in a dense environment, but also give them some room to breathe. Um, but I still see that need that people are, you know, density isn't going to go away totally uh, because of this, because so much of our world population lives that way now. Uh, but what is from your perspective, and I know it's something you, you watch and you're passionate about, Brad, uh, do you think we're going to have any long-term impacts to the design of environments because of the pandemic, especially dense environments? Um, it's one of those things that I have to admit, I thought about this and I still am like really wrestling with it. I, I think if I, if I knew this pandemic was a one in 100 year event, and so we had a, another long period, um, and, you know, without something of this nature, I would say, you know, invest in density. It's, it's you know, it'll, in two years, that's where things will be again, we'll, we'll pick up. I, I don't know that I don't know how long this will last and that what people's reaction will be to it. So um, I think in parts of the world where they're already pretty much, you know, reopened, you know, uh, safely, uh, my, my sense is yes, they, they will re-embrace density because their cities are built that way. You know, where their cities are already built that way, they're not going to tear them down. Uh, in places where it's taking a lot longer, the memory of this will be longer. So where you live, the memory of this will be longer. And I think the, the it's sort of, we now need to rethink, okay, can we develop, which I think we can, by the way, I just don't know what it'll look like yet, a newer model that embraces what we liked about density or what we yeah. want to keep ourselves safe because we don't think this is a one and 100 year event. We think, you know, we could be facing this again it with it, you know, within 10 years, or at least within our lifetimes or children's lifetimes. So in that case, it is a matter, but it's not one of these things where you and I can sit together and, and say, this is the new model. But I think there are processes that we can run with people who are most affected by this, both young and old, and say, okay, you know, look, this is what we want to come up with. We want to take the best of keeping ourselves safe, but also what we really liked about the dense environments. We want to re see if there's a different way of thinking about urbanization. That, that also, as I said, you know, maintains some of the environmental benefits of density as well. Yeah. So, uh, Peter, I'm going to give you one of the questions. This is a tough questions, and I didn't want this to be uh, political in a political year for us in the States. Um, but uh, well, somebody asked, and I think it has to be asked, uh, why can't we have more social intervention in, in times like this? Uh, and uh, like, like the Europeans, that was a question, I, don't, I, can't, I can't find the name of it right now, but that was definitely um, a question from the audience. Why can't we have more social interventions? I mean, there, there are interventions, um, they're not working. <laughs> um, so, there, the, uh, the question um, could be, why are we having more effective uh, interventions? Um, and that response would be um, kind of like I'd said before, there, there's the trust and the communication, the risk perception, the risk behavior, and the glue that uh, makes that communication affect the behavior are so fundamentally important to uh, interventions and responses. And it's, like I said, it's overlooked because we're taking test tubes and, you know, we have to have the vaccines and those are necessary but not sufficient because if you have the vaccine but people don't take it, what good is a vaccine? And, and yeah. in that same way, um, we haven't had, uh, we're not a, a, um, a, a China where we have, a, we can lock down and with guns, people on the corners, uh, and we're not also um, willing to accept behavioral suggestions. So why we haven't been successful is that our communication and our, you know, messaging 
hasn't been targeted to the people and the, and the, and the institutions that could make it. So last statement would be like, look at what's been effective with the mask. It's not been messaging from our, our officials, health or government officials, it's been the grocery stores. They are the ones who said, you can't come into Home Depot without a mask. And so that's going to you know, have the effect that we're trying to get. Okay, we've got, we've got four minutes, so I'm gonna try and uh, wrap it up and let anybody offer any closing comments. But uh, what I wanted to say to the audience, there was a, really a lot of good questions. And uh, I love the technology, the way we do these. And so we're gonna capture those. And if you wanna stay involved uh, and you want your question answered offline uh, uh, after this, please let us know. We'll try and get to them as many as possible. Um, and uh, we are gonna develop a white paper after this. and uh may reach out to some of you that have had some really good good comments um the uh you know in in summary what i what i've heard and is that from it was somewhat of a comfort from the epidem epidemiologist that this isn't necessarily an age of pandemics that uh, we have a lot of systems that we have in place to keep it in control and uh you know and we're going to learn from this experience um what I heard from the economist is that uh, if we can, the big unknown, if we can get through this uh, quickly, and there's a lot of good vaccine questions, which we'll try and get to offline, but if we can get to a place where we're, we feel safe about it, our, you know, what I've heard from several people, there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines ready to get the economy going, looking for the deals or looking to reinvest in things that are gonna accelerate because of this. So we could return pretty quickly uh, we can't forget the social obligations when we return and we have to accelerate those as well. What I heard from the environmentalist is uh, this, you know, the thing that really kind of, this is an unusual ex experiment, almost in a sense, a, an odd way to get a gift in terms of the environment, but being able to study a different kind of way of living for on the globe. And uh, there's a lot of data that's going to come out of this that's gonna influence policy decision-making going forward for the better. And it's an opportunity we would have never had um, if this didn't happen at this scale. So I think, I think there's a lot of encouraging stuff and a lot of work to be done. And uh, the people that belong to LAI are in positions to influence that. So we appreciate uh, the, the broad attendance we had and we'd like to continue the dialogue as well. Um, Sheila, did you wanna add anything in, in closing? Yeah. From I would, thank you, Bill. I wanna thank you and particularly Holly Elmore that have uh, put all the background work and effort into making this happen. This has been a great exchange today. I've already seen comments coming in. Please answer my question, please answer my question. So uh, Bill, you've maybe volunteered yourself for a lot more work. Um, I also, someone else pointed out, uh, don't limit yourself just to these global webinars. Uh, look at the LAI website. We send out at least every other week what are the upcoming meetings? And right now you've got a great opportunity to get some of that additional cross-cultural fertilization because you might see a meeting in some other chapter that you'd like to learn more about. And I know some people that have done that and have found them very worthwhile. I also wanna take this time to uh, thank all the panelists. You were extremely well-informed. Uh, you gave us a lot of great information and um, those of you that are interested in exploring more programs like this and wanna be more involved in how LAI can keep this up, please do let me know. You see the addresses for emails there on the website. And um, I just wanna take this opportunity to thank everybody. This has been a great program. Yeah, I wanna thank the speakers too. Thank you, a great group of people to, to, to have this conversation. And here in Atlanta, we're looking to build the chapter. So uh, reach out if you have some interest and. We'll, we'll show you the next steps. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, everybody. You. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.